Prophetic words by South African Communist Party leader Chris Haney just a year before Polish immigrant Janusz Walisz shot and killed him in his driveway in April 1993. It was the third major assassination attempt on Haney's life. He was the right wing's enemy number one and was generally distrusted by white South Africans. Yet, like so often happens, after his death, he was widely recognized as a soldier who had become a man of peace, a man of reconciliation. One wonders what role Chris Heine would have played or what position he would have been in now had he lived. This past week, Heine's assassin, Janusz Walisz, and the man who helped him plan the murder, Clive Darby Lewis, appeared before the Truth Commission's Amnesty Committee in Pretoria to ask for amnesty. Dawn Park, Easter Saturday, 1993. Chris Harney, the man who many thought would someday become President of South Africa, lies dead in the driveway of his home. The country is plunged into mourning, anger and fear. There are whispers of a race war and a tremor runs through the tenuous negotiation process. We are a nation in mourning. Our pain and anger is real. Yet we must not permit ourselves to be provoked by those who seek to deny us the very freedom Chris Hani gave his life for. Let us respond with dignity in a disciplined fashion. But across the country, the youth, particularly the black youth, rampage through cities giving vent to their anger. Nine days after Chris Harney is slain, a mass funeral is held in a Johannesburg stadium. Thousands come to pay their last respects. Millions more watch the funeral live on television. As Harney is laid to rest, the brilliant future of this MK soldier, fiery communist and people's hero, also comes to an end. The killers have a nation's brittle anger on their conscience. Polish immigrant Janusz Walusz and CP member Clyde Darby Lewis have been found guilty of murdering SACP chief Chris Harney in April. Co-accused, Mrs. Gay Darby Lewis, was acquitted on all charges. The Rand Supreme Court found that the case against assassin Walusz was overwhelming and that evidence clearly showed direct intent. Pretoria City Hall, four and a half years later, the men sentenced to death for the murder and now serving life sentences come to ask for amnesty. They are ferried from prison under heavy security. At the hearing, the anger at Hani's killing is still evident in the chanting and toy-toying and many blunt messages on posters. The two sides in this South African tragedy have come together in this hall for the final chapter of this horror story. Clive Darby Lewis calls himself an English-speaking Afrikaner. He says he bought the gun for the killing and gave the address. Today he is simply a murderer imprisoned for his crime. But once he moved in high political circles, holding court in public and in the media. So what you are in the fact democratic saying, right... Just hold on, let him finish. Stop interrupting, Mr. Faree. Mm. Give me the chance now. I listen to you. Yes. Because the white people of South Africa have been deprived of the right to exercise their opposition to what the National Party government is doing at the moment. Janusz Walusz is a Polish immigrant. 
From Europe he brought his family and a passionate hate for communism. Little is known about this man who volunteered to shoot Chris Harney at point-blank range. He shows no emotion. His eyes stare without expression. Gay Darby Lewis, wife of Clive, a former nun from Australia, now turned South African right-wing fanatic. This is the woman who helped draw up a list of so-called enemies of South Africa. Chris Harney's name was on that list. Her role in the assassination remains unclear and murky. Dimpo Hani, the widow of the assassinated Communist Party leader and MK soldier, a politician in her own right. She sits in the front row of the hearing, facing the killers every day. But it was Clive Darby Lewis who took centre stage this week. For five days he played the politician, reminiscing about his rise in the old South Africa and his fall in the new. Darby Lewis wants the committee to believe that the Conservative Party approved of his plot to kill. He maintains that Afrikaners had been called up to the so-called Third Liberation War. With his speech on the 2nd of February 1990, when he announced the unbanning of not only the ANC, but also the SA Communist Party. It became obvious to many people, myself included, that Mr. F. W. de Klerk and his colleagues were preparing to betray us all. On the 26th of May, 1990, the late Dr. Andre Stjernicht had made his and the CP's feelings and intentions clear when he, addressing the largest political rally ever held at the Fuertreka Monument, I believe that in the region of 150,000 people were there, Mr. Chairman, and it was really a large rally, I was there myself, called the people up to the third freedom struggle. As the two previous freedom struggles were wars, this was clearly a call to arms for Afrikaners. I said, there are the power, there are the are the organizations. Help the time to rape make when not the African folk, but also other folk. The manier for the Christian folk's freedom shall fast grip and shall uitroep, here stand us, God help us, us can not anders nie. As the declared treachery became more and more obvious, or should I maybe say the declared regime, the National Party regime treachery became more and more obvious, and as it was just as obvious to us that the armed struggle was the only option now, now open to us, we discussed how best we could strike a crippling blow against the communist leadership as the real enemy. It was obvious to us that the late Chris Harney, as the leader of the Communist Party, was the real threat to our future and that of the Republic of South Africa. The proceedings were continually held up by requests for adjournments by the applicants' lawyers. At the heart of the wrangling were certain documents that the Harney family lawyers had produced. These included the police interrogation records of Gay and Clive Darby Lewis and Janusz Walusz. The applicant said these documents should not be allowed because their admissions about the murder had been made under duress and included many lies. Mr. Bezos is going to use statements made under duress, which half of them are rubbish, and when people are drunk, and then he's going to say, yes, but you said that there and you said that in your application, and, it, and it's contradictory. We don't know. To what degree they're going to worry about the contradiction of one statement to another? Are they going to just say, oh, well, that's not really important? Are they going to say, that contradiction is enough to stop amnesty? The Harney lawyers asked why the applicants had remained silent about the existence of these records. They said it showed that the applicants were not making a full disclosure. I want to read, uh, firstly, to hand in. A cop copies of a, the let a letter 
on President Council letterheads written by Mr. Darby Lewis to the Colonel in charge of the investigation on the 16th of May 1993. Dear Colonel, Dear Colonel brief, just a brief letter. On on e and to e you personnel, and your staff, bedank, in order to thank you, alma I on hope. shall remember you all Friendlicher Friendlicher Gruder, positive thoughts. Clive Derb Darby Lewis. Kind regards, Clive Darby Lewis. One of the central issues in the complicated story dished out to the Amnesty Committee is that of a so-called hit list. The list contained the names of many prominent people, including that of Chris Harney. The list had been obtained from Darby Lewis's wife and given to Janusz Walusz. The committee seemed perplexed at the explanation that it was not a hit list, but merely a list of addresses needed for journalistic purposes. Uh, the first uh, address given is uh, that of Mr. Nelson Mandela, and then there are some notes, the house such and so and so is deliberately not numbered but is easily recognizable by blah, blah, blah. It's obvious why this description is there, Mr. Chairman, to me, and that is because the house was not numbered, there had to be another way of identifying the house for further follow-up purposes. The second uh, address, Mr. Chairman, was... Excuse me, uh, Mr. W. Lewis, Sorry. if that is so, why was it necessary for that list to have specific information with regard to the high-tech electronic surveillance system which was in that house? I have no idea, Mr. Chairman. In fact, that has really puzzled me about this whole thing. That kind of detail that appears, uh, I find it difficult that it serves some journalistic purpose. As far as the journalistic purposes are concerned, uh, the reason why this whole thing was being done was because my wife was busy with articles, a, a series of articles on people jumping onto the gravy train. And, Mr. Chairman, it was rather difficult to understand at that stage, quite honestly, with our knowledge of the salaries that members of the ANC-SACP alliance were earning from their own organization, how they could afford the type of houses in which they were living. Do I understand your evidence that Mr. Valus asked you for the address of Chris Harney? Is that what actually happened? Uh, no, Mr. Chairman. What, what I, I said was that uh, I remembered that we had addresses of certain ANC personnel, and when I acquired that, uh, Mr. Harney's address was on there, and Mr. Valus undertook to... Uh, he, yeah, he said that he would, uh, he would accept Harney as a target. But we mutually agreed on uh, Hani as a target anyway. Darby Lewis provided Janusz Walusz with a pistol needed for the assassination. Well, um, the whole objective was to plunge the country into a situation where as a result of the chaos which we anticipated would occur as a result of the assassination, that people on the right would be inspired to mobilize and use this vacuum caused by the chaos to effect a counter-revolution and to take over power of the country. That was the whole object, and I mean, that's why a man like the late Chris Harney had to be the target. Because, I mean, imagine if, if we targeted anyone else, anyone else, there was no one that had the sort of following that the late Chris Harney had. And as I said earlier, I said, perhaps it was even a, a tribute to the status of Chris Harney that he was selected as a target. On the fifth day of the hearings, Clive Darby Lewis was finally taken under cross-examination. The Harney family opposes the granting of amnesty, and their legal team aimed to show that Clive Darby Lewis had a history of lying to courts. They also implied that he was lying about his wife's involvement in planning the assassination. Did you lie to your attorney? 
I did, Mr. Chairman. Nobody compelled you to lie to your attorney. No one compelled me, Mr. Chairman, except for the fact that I was busy with an armed struggle and I was determined to give as much opposition as possible under any circumstances. What support did you think that the honourable people in the Conservative Party would have given you if they knew that you were in fact guilty at a time when you contended you were not guilty, that you had committed perjury and that you were attempting to defeat the ends of justice? Mr. Chairman, my impression of the support I obtained was that my supporters believed that the end, the cause deserved the end used. You claim throughout your evidence on a number of occasions that you are a religious man, Mr. W. Lewis. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And that you punctuated your evidence from time to time that some of the things that happened appear to you to be the will of the Almighty. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. You also went so far as to suggest that the late Dr. Dr. Trunick's religious background uh, influenced you in some way. Are you going to tell the committee that your religion and your depth of uh, belief in the Almighty gives you the right to commit perjury and to attempt to defeat the ends of justice? Mr. Chairman, in an armed struggle, all tactics are fair and I've already expressed my regret over certain actions which I had to take. Yes. Nobody uh, comfortably, willingly contravenes the law, no matter whose law it is. Can you give the committee any yardstick in terms of which they could judge that you possibly not lying during these proceedings as part of the armed struggle? Mr. Chairman, anyone attending a hearing like this, where truth is of the essence, would be an absolute idiot to even endeavour to lie to this committee. How Only much... Thank you, Pardon. Sorry, carry on. No, How I'm much going. wiser were you when you falsely tried to reopen your trial? I don't understand the insinuation in that question, Mr. The Chairman. insinuation is a simple one, Mr. Darby Lewis, that you say that anyone who tries to mislead this committee would be very foolish because the truth has to be told. Has, didn't the truth have to be told to the judge president of this, of this division? when you tried to bluff your way through in setting aside your conviction and sentence? Mr. Chairman, I explained and I repeat again, it was part of the struggle and any tactic was suitable. Yes. To now lie before this committee, what would I gain out of lying, Mr. Chairman? To go free in order to continue the struggle. Now, you know what the question is? It says that you and your wife had vague plans at the beginning that some sort of arrangement should be made to liquidate one or perhaps more leaders of the ANC and the SA Communist Party. That is not is that correct that is or not, incorrect? That is incorrect, Mr. Chairman. Are we to understand, Mr. Darby Lewis, that your wife, a particularly active political person, who had a column of her own in the Patriot, written in English up to a certain stage, who wrote speeches for the leaders of the Conservative Party, and who was politically active, that you conspired with Mr. Wallows, this first applicant in this case, without giving her any hint of what your thoughts on the matter were, ever. That is correct, Mr. Chairman, well, and I explained in evidence why. We did not want to involve our women folk. It was too dangerous. Yes. Uh, we did not want to involve your wa our wives was a statement made at a time when you were protecting her 
And I'm going to suggest to you that one of the reasons why you didn't give evidence is that you knew that if you gave evidence, in all probability, your wife may have been convicted on the strength of your evidence. That is not correct, Mr. Chairman. Very well. But telling the truth is not enough for amnesty. Darby Lewis must prove that he was working within the structures of an accepted political organization. Let me read the words that you would no doubt, would no doubt have come into to your notice, uh, Mr. Darby Lewis, when you committed this murder as to the policy of the Conservative Party on whose behalf you claim to have acted. I am reading, Mr. Chairman, I thought that copies had been made. They have not. We will see to it that copies will be made for the committee. But may I read out the relevant passage? Listen carefully, Mr. Darby Lewis, what your colleague, Mr. D.P. Duplessis, said. Who is Mr. D.P. Duplessis? Uh, he was the Member of Parliament for Vonderburm. It's Wednesday, the 21st of October, 1992, at page 1200, sorry, 12,806. on the right-hand column. The Honorable Member said that he was at the Fortrecker Monument on 26 May 1990. At the Fortrecker Monument it was said that the Third Liberation struggle had begun. Of course the Third Liberation struggle has begun. Square bracket interjections. Close square bracket. The fact that I say that the Honourable Members here today does not imply that they should go out and plant bombs tomorrow, interjection. There were 1,300, I'm sorry, there were 130,000 people present at the occasion. How many of them have gone out and planted bombs? My honourable reader, that would be Dr. Trunicht, wouldn't it? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. My honourable reader has said repeatedly that nothing gives an individual the right to commit crimes or misdeeds. If he does commit them, he does so at his own peril. He should know that there are laws in this country, and if he breaks them, he should take the blame and punishment for it. Now, uh, surely such an important statement must have come to the notice of an important leader of the Conservative Party, such as yourself. Mr. Chairman, as a member of the President's Council, I was not a recipient of the Hansard. And unless I was in Cape Town and in the House at that time, I wouldn't have heard about it. The issue that I am questioning you on is whether you acted on behalf of the Conservative Party or not. And I am asking you, and the committee, with respect, is entitled to a straight answer. What I'm saying, Mr. Chairman, is that Mr. Duplessis was referring to violence. Dr. Tjernit was talking war. Oh, I see. There's a difference, is there, between killing people in war and killing people by assassins? There is, Mr. Chairman. There is. Is that a form of your Conservative Party logic, Mr. Darby Mr. Lewis? Mr. Chairman, assassination is an act of war. It can, participate, can, can occur during a war situation. I see. Clearly, sir. The Hoflayer says, don't commit crimes. Is that right? Mr. Chairman, then you must describe a crime. When is a crime a crime? When you're involved with a freedom struggle, is a crime a crime? When murder, you're involved in a wartime situation. Murder is a crime, Mr. Darby Lewis. But then, Mr. Chairman, then you must uh, refuse to accept the ANC's crimes as well because they also murdered. No, Mr. You missed the point entirely. Let's yeah. leave the ANC cases for another hearing, Mr. Darby Lewis. Let's deal with yours.